So um, these are our participants today, and I'll just briefly introduce them uh, now. Uh, right, so uh, we have Adrienne Hart, um, who is a choreographer and artistic director of Neon Dance, and she has worked all over the world, and her work has been commissioned by all of the main people who commissioned dance work uh, in the UK. She has also worked in Japan. Then uh, Hema Fillimore is a lecturer in robotics at the University of Bristol, uh, who specializes in soft energy autonomous and biohybrid robots. And she's been working with artists and performers uh, on uh, interactive artworks, combining sound, touch and play, including uh, the work that we'll be talking about today, um, which she worked on with Adrienne. And then our third participant today is Professor Takashi Ikegami, uh, who is Professor at the Department of General Systems Sciences at the University of Tokyo. Um, so he's working on various issues to do with robotics and artificial life. Um, and uh, he's published, for instance, the book Between, In Between Man and Machine, uh, and he is also working on various art-related uh, uh, projects, media arts projects, including uh, Offloaded Agency, which was uh, at the Barbican in 2019. So this is the timeline. We're going to run on a little bit longer than usual, um, and it's fairly free form, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but that's everything from me, and I'm now going to hand over to Adrienne, who is going to introduce herself and then pass on to everybody else. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, yeah, I'm going to kick off with the, the introductions. Uh, um, uh, as you know, my name is Adrienne Hartz. I'm the Artistic Director of Neon Dance. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background about the company, uh, we're based in Swindon, which for those of you listening from outside of the UK, um, it's in the southwest of, of England, about an hour out of London. Um, and for the past 16 years, we've been creating dance works that explore technology and design with the body as a central tenant. And collaboration is at the heart of my practice. And I bring together artists, musicians, technologists, scientists and academics to create collectively what we could not create alone. Uh, exploring um, or exploration around the body in relation to its environment, both digital and physical, has long influenced my work. In my most recent production titled Puzzle Creature, I responded to the, uh, to the work of artist-architect duo Arakara and Madeleine Gins, who purposely deployed procedural tools that confuse, disorientate, and question the body's relationship to its surroundings. If you haven't heard of Arakara and Gins before, I urge you to look them up. Um, if you, yeah, they, uh, and actually, if you happen to be in Japan, you can stay in one of their artworks called Reversible Destiny Lofts, which is in the outskirts of Tokyo in Mitaka. And in fact, it was that first research trip to Japan back in 2017, when I was first introduced to Takashi Ekagami um, by Momoya Huma, the director of Arakara and Gin's Reversible Destiny Foundation. I enjoy presenting work in different contexts, from theatres to libraries to museums. For example, we premiered Puzzle Creature at Echiko Samari Art Triennial um, in 2018 in a converted schoolhouse in Nagata Prefecture. And this work went on to tour uh, to Oxford University's Museum of Natural History, a whole host of theatres and music venues, and even a huge club in the heart of Liverpool here in the UK. Uh, it's often in these unexpected spaces I see this convergence of different audiences, different people coming together and getting excited about the same subject matter. Uh, so in a little bit I'm going to share a short video and some early ideas from a new work uh, by Neon Dance that I've been creating in collaboration with Hema Fullimore that integrates swarm robotics. Uh, but first, I'm going to hand over to Takashi to introduce himself. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, uh, it's my great honor uh, to be here uh, in many uh, more than 100 people, you know, attending for this uh, conference. Um, so, um, uh, 
let me introduce what I'm doing. I think it's, it's easier to understand. Uh, I, I don't know whether people are interested in my background, but my foreground is how to make life, right? Uh, artificial life, what I call artificial life is my, my business. And then, so the definition of artificial life is um, uh, the theory of brain and evolution. So people don't know about what how the brain works and people uh, never, uh, you know, actually have seen how the evolution takes place for a billion years um, uh, long, right? So this, we actually, we definitely need a theory to explain that. That's what the artificial life is about, right? And then artificial life, the conference, this conference has been uh, founded in 1987 by Chris Lanton in, in, in the United States in the desert, right? It's, uh, it's in, in Los Alamos. So, um, I I've joined this conference and then we've been discuss, we've been making a sort of a complex uh, artificial creatures or some robots or programs that shows more sort of weird motions, right? And then one of my uh, one of my hero, his uh, his name is Rodney Brooks. Rod Brooks is a uh, he's a uh, uh, he's the CEO of um, uh, I iRobot I company, and then he he become very famous for as he he made a um, he made a uh, Roomba is a famous uh, radio uh, artificial what I call artificial life vacuum cleaner right this uh, Roomba is moving around in the space and cleans up everything right and and that was very much uh, attractive and I, but when I, we discussed about our, our, our discussed artificial life and he said. But Takashi, you know, um, none of those programs or robots are not life. You can't, you can't deceive, right? You can't be deceived. This is this is just an artificial something, but uh, you know, apparently they are not living, right? So what is missing? So that's what we've been discussing. Right? So what's missing? Why is this robot is robot and not life? What's the difference? And then you know, maybe we have uh, um, the models uh, to a little simple. And then the actual life is more complex. Or maybe we have only uh, uh, computational power is not good enough to simulate all these complex systems. Maybe true. Or maybe the parameter set is uh, too many, right? The, the model is right, but the parameters are sm is, is not you know, uh, uh, correctly chosen, right? So that's why those ro robots cannot become alive. Or maybe we are missing the fundamental principle. Maybe there's an unknown fundamental principle of life, and we have to find out the principle. That's that's that may be the case, right? So, um, artificial life is, and then also my journey is how to find what is the final missing uh, dro uh, drip, right? So once we put some uh, residual drop uh, on the robot. Then the robot becomes live, right? So we call it, uh, or maybe the small uh, drop of, of juice. So we call it um, a Brooks juice. So uh, the mission of artificial life is how to um, how to find this uh, Brooks juice, right? And then Brooks juice, I don't know what the Brooks juice look like, right? Maybe it's a fundamental uh, principle, or maybe some very very complex something that we uh, we never um, seen before, right? But that's uh, actually, that's why I'm, I'm making a, a little chemical droplet that is moving around or um, uh, making a strange uh, robot interacting with each other and whether they become life or they can have a consciousness in, 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 in themselves. So that's, that's something that I've been doing. And this, um, I'm joining this on Adrian's uh, new performance. It's another way to see, to find out what's the missing, what's the Brooks juice still we, ha we are exploring. So it's my introduction. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, hand over to Emma. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> <What do you? laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm Emma Fillimore. I'm a, a lecturer in robotics at uh, University of Bristol. Um, and my, my work is sort of around uh, soft and, and biohybrid robots and, and robots that sort of live in um, a kind of intersection between an artificial and a natural 
ecosystem. So I'm, I'm very interested in robots that can take their energy from the environment in, in similar ways to natural organisms and to sort of become part of a living ecosystem either by um, being biodegradable, by the behavior that they have with that ecosystem, and by the way that they move or um, how they are sort of environmentally sustainable within that, that ecosystem. Um, so I've sort of been working in this area for some time and this is how I, I became to meet Takashi and, and, and Adrian and it's sort of taken us in this sort of new direction <laughs> uh, together. I'd always been really fascinated uh, in Takashi's work in artificial life and in this sort of questioning of, of what a robot would need to have in order to be a living thing or to um, sort of fit within a, a living system. Um, and so when I was based in Japan, I was really fascinated to, to go and, uh, and meet Takashi and see his work and then somehow serendipitously also <laughs> then met Adrian and, and started our conversations around um, sort of what role robots could play in um, the kind of uh, extension or augmentation of, of humans as a way of, of connecting humans as a way of fitting within a sort of a social ecosystem. Um, so I became very interested in this idea of, of the social ecosystem as a sort of another layer in addition to this environmental um, sort of ecology. Um, and I think we're, we're starting to see a lot of, of use of robots within our social ecosystems. And, and that's really sort of grown in prevalence throughout um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and, and we're seeing robots in, in social spaces and creative spaces as enablers for humans rather than something that sort of invalidates um, humans. So examples that we've, I guess, drawn on in this work are things like um, the uh, Robot Dawn Cafe in, in Tokyo, which um, uh, was open for a brief period uh, last year where uh, robot avatars were used as, as ways to um, enable people with severe physical paralysis to, to access a working environment in a social space. So I'm really interested in, in the role of, of soft and, and bio-inspired robots in this and, and the sort of um, their role in kind of uh, people's self-belief in their, their avatar, their sort of trust in self-representation. Um, and so the work for Ancient Blooms, which Adrian will explain uh, a lot more about um, in, in a moment, um, through this, uh, this is a really, I think for me, this is a really interesting uh, sort of experiment in how uh, the sort of softness compliance and uh, biomimetic behavior of some of the robots that we work with in, in that space can, can help robots and humans to sort of fit closer together in the same uh, same, the same ecosystem. So with that, I'll hand over to Adrian to talk a bit more about the project. Brilliant, thank you so much, Emma. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna just launch straight into uh, uh, probably about a 10 minute presentation in a way of, of prehension blooms. I should add, this is very much a work in progress. It's not finished. And part of, uh, for me, and I, and I think I can speak on behalf of uh, Takashi and, and Hema, the exciting part of, of taking part in a talk event like this is that uh, we really value your comments and, and feedback. So uh, later on, um, please do, or, or um, as I'm talking, if, if a question pops into your head, hopefully we can pick up on it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So um, Prehension Blooms is a, is a work that's actually come out of a, a period of researching um, and looking at the origins of loneliness. Uh, it explores the idea that loneliness stems from the interaction of the individual with the social realm, so that it's not just mental, but also physical, sensorial and material. And of course, the pandemic has played a role in this work. We've been forced to work to develop ideas through remote collaboration. However, there's been some positives that have come out of that process. For example, that sort of lived experience informing the decision to embed an offer within the work for remote audiences that I'll go on to describe in a little bit. So in Prehension Blooms, uh, it, audiences will be free to roam in a performance space that can scale up or down. They will encounter an insect-like robot community and each other in playful and unexpected ways. By moving, sitting, lying down and congregating in the space, audiences can influence all aspects of the performance. Prehension Blooms can function as a 60 minute performance work. 
and or an installation. And as with my previous work, we plan to take prehension blooms to a range of different spaces and places, and therefore have had to consider a flexible design. However, our overall aim in a way is for members of the public entering the space to feel intimately connected to their environment. And alongside HEMA um, and the Bristol Robotics Lab, we've invited the visual artist Anna Rekovic to help design the robots. Uh, composer Sebastian Reynolds will create an original score. Um, and we have the lighting designer, Nico Devouche on board, as well as a team of highly skilled dance artists. We're currently at the stage of prototyping design ideas. So I'm going to now share a short behind the scenes video uh, taken um, in Anna Rekovic's studio just literally last weekend um, with a number of possible designs. The general uh, robot design ideas are coming from this idea of social insects and cooperative collective behaviors. But let me first show the video and then I can go into a bit more detail. So bear with me just whilst I share my screen. Hopefully now you can all see the screen. Okay, so there we go. It's a little taster of, of what Anna's been up to in her, her studio. I'm just going to um, keep sharing my screen for a little bit uh, and bring up a still image of, of one of the designs. There are about six in the making at the minute, so this has definitely not been decided yet. Um, so if I, yeah, I'll just bring this up. So. Um, what I'd love to do is just describe a little bit about some of the, these ideas. Um, the idea for the robots is that they have uh, telsons constructed of many different modular parts, which can all move both in unison and separately. Uh, we're also exploring the idea that they can be reactive to touch, light and proximity, changing movements and shape depending on their surroundings. Um, and I should point out this, this central base at the minute um, isn't designed. It, it's just uh, representing uh, the, uh, the sort of main robotic body. Um, and, and then the next stage is to work really closely with Hema and Anna to consider um, how that might be designed. Are the, the inner workings of the body um, uh, able to be seen? Um, will they be disguised? Um, yeah, so, so there's many, many more questions and, and ideas around the design to be discussed. But one possible scenario is that uh, an audience member or performer could come up to one of the robots and touch its body. Perhaps then the creature grows or shrinks in response or even wraps itself around their arm. I also like the idea of the robots combining and reconfiguring into a, a new hybrid form. And the next stage is, as I mentioned, to work closely with Hema and Anna to discover what is and isn't possible. 
through this kind of iterative process um, and how the current designs might need to adapt or change. Um, before I move on, I'd like to just share one other um, aspect of this. So bear with me just whilst I exit from this image and bring up something a bit different. Hopefully you can all see my screen. So as well as the robots, we're also thinking about their immediate environment. The idea of some kind of sensory vessel from which the robots emerge and where robots can disappear and hide. And for this idea, again, we turned to nature and looked at social birds' nests um, and fungi, specifically cage fungus, as well as embryotic plants and seeds. Um, and this first image that you're, you're looking at right now is um, uh, of, of the cage fungus. And I, I find it really fascinating. Um, if, I, if I didn't know what it was, I, I would have perhaps said, this is something that's been 3D printed. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, phenomena. And, and, it, and I guess something that uh, both myself, Hema and Anna all share is, is kind of looking to, to nature to find um, inspiration even though we're working um, with, with sort of uh, very cutting edge use of te technology. Um, so so they're, they're the cage idea. Um, this, this one is more about the kind of seed or, or merging from, from some kind of um, outer shell. Uh, now this is the social birds nest that, that I was re referring to. Uh, and I, I really didn't know this existed. I, I find it really fascinating. I always thought of birds as creating their own nests and being very um, uh, possessive of, of their immediate environment. But this idea of cohabiting um, and what that might mean if we create an environment for our robots where they, they um, are in a shared space. So there's a few different examples there. Um, and then, yeah, this is the the seed idea. And then finally, one more of, of, of the cages. Okay, so I'm gonna now stop sharing my screen. So that's, that's where we're currently at. Um, the new work is due to premiere in 2022. We'll continue to share behind the scenes footage as well as offer opportunities for participants to take part um, and help us co-design the robots throughout this year. And if you're interested in finding out more, uh, you can head to, to neondance.org, which is our website, um, and you can contact me directly through the contact page, but also we'll, yeah, we'll be posting video footage um, and, and all the, the details of any workshops. Um, and we'll also probably be looking for test audiences to try our robots out on uh, very soon. So before I bring Takashi and Hema back into the conversation, I'd like to share one final aspect of the work that poses a challenge, but also I think if we get it right, could radically change the live performance experience. Within our robot community, there will be up to six tele-operated robots which enable remote audiences to traverse the environment, interacting with physical audiences, fellow robots and performers. Um, and Emma offered an example earlier of, of the type of technology used to achieve this social interaction um, at the Avatar Cafe in Tokyo. But this additional element has come out of us asking the question, how can I be present and connect with other bodies in a space where I am not? So I'll leave it there and perhaps invite some initial responses from Takashi and Hema. Well, maybe Hema. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I, I, was, I was chatting with, with the audience. Yeah, there's been some lively but, discussion. Yeah, but, by really the way, so, so my, the, first of all, I think, you know, the one of the, one of the problems that we have to discuss is, um, you know, the body is not this body, right? The body can be anywhere, right? I mean, like uh, Gin Alcoa and Gin said, you know, uh, the body or, or 
our embodiment, our body is not like a, just a physical body with, uh, with these uh, materials, but it can be you know, distributed all over the world. And then this environment itself is, is my body, right? So uh, this kind of idea that uh, it's not a physical entity, but it can be distributed all over the world so that you never die. That's what the Arakawa's claim, right? You will never die, right? Because your, your body is everywhere. So that your consciousness is also also distributed everywhere, right? So the definition of embodiment or definition of boundary of the body should be uh, should be varied, right? And it should be should be changed. So that's the, I think it's just very much starting point of why uh, why the robot you know most of the robot is, is believe that you know this is a body and this is not body, right? And then controlling part is within the body and then you know outside of the body there's nothing but that's a too simple-minded way of describing what happens there right only the artist knows that okay mind is not encapsulated in the body but can be distributed all over the world so that's i think we should uh, discuss and then how mind and body is not that simply uh, you know related to be with each other so the hardware software metaphor is, is mis misleading Right. We think that the computer metaphor is uh, strong enough to understand how the brain works, but I think you know the, this metaphor of a separated hardware and software is very much misleading. Right. We have to have a different kind of metaphor. That's how you know. That's why Adrian is you know uh, elaborating to make some I don't know what's this? <laughs> uh, different types of body, different types of uh, robots, different types of uh, engagement of robots in humankind. That's my, that's my, uh, the initial uh, uh, step. Yes, please, him. Yeah, I really like that. I know, that's 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 probably got a, a really important role to play in kind of addressing loneliness with this, because I suppose with with the the sort of goal or we think about something that is measurable within what we're doing it's the idea of bringing uh, people closer together or somehow kind of um, reducing reducing loneliness and I think that the way that we'd initially thought about doing it was that people would occupy different uh, different spaces but then there's the sort of length of the performance or the, the length of the experiment the fact that that finishes and, and that stops but if we think about distributing um, this sort of consciousness in space through these different robots avatars, then there's no reason why we can't distribute it through time as well, right? So you could kind of feed into this robot community and then the sort of um, your input at a given time, your kind of um, telepresence, if you like, could then feed forward into how that, uh, that mm -hmm. sort of um, autonomous robot behavior sort of propagates forward. I think we've been working very much from the idea of these kind of self-contained time incidents, you know, when a when a museum opens, when a gallery space opens, when a performance space opens, but actually maybe something that we can um, offer through having uh, an artificial body is the fact that you can occupy the same space or continue interacting with, with other agents, mm -hmm. be them kind of robot or being, or kind of like merge between human and robot at the time, through time as well as just in a different place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, conceptually, you know, going back to, I, I think Takashi and I have uh, uh, been uh, obsessed, or I certainly am, with, with the work of Arakara Gins. And, and I, I guess with this work, uh, I'm kind of aiming to cultivate what Arakara Gins would refer to as the architectural body, um, as a potential cure for loneliness. Um, so, so this idea of the body and its immediate environment being one and the same. And perhaps there's, there's little room for loneliness if life is a, a stream of constant connections where you're relating not just to other people, but also objects and environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice to see Darren Lanny as being mentioned in the uh, chat box. <laughs> I wonder if you yes. yeah. some things from the, from the chat, maybe, into... Yeah, sure, why not? Um, yeah, well, I don't know whether... Can, can I show one, uh, one um, movie, if possible? Um, yeah, let me... Uh, I don't know whether you can uh, properly uh, can see this one, but... Uh, So this is uh, this is the computer simulation of myself. Um, it's uh, millions of birds. You know, it, actually, it's a two to the nineteenth numbers of birds uh, moving around in space. 
So I don't know whether. So this is how those bars are moving around. I I don't know whether it can smoothly uh, display it in the screen, but um, so the the swarming behavior is emerging property. And we only have uh, three different rules. Very very simple three rules like. Uh, attracting each other, separating from each other, and then alignment of the heading directions. These three simple rules that you can find this uh, very, very complex uh, swarming behaviors, right? If you, you scale up the size of the agents, so it's, it's up to the, you know, one million or something, then, you know, suddenly, I mean, after like 10,000, after, you know, you can see this uh, very complex entangled swarming behavior emerges. So. That's what I think, that's what, you know, the emergence is about. And then artificial life is trying to find out what you can't see in a single agent, but once they, they are, you know, uh, making a, you know, swarm, then there's something emerges. Uh, that's uh, what the artif artificial life is about. So I just wanted to claim this. Um, so when you have about swarms, robots, and moving each other, there must be something that emerges there, right? So this emergence is something that we have to find or we have to explore. Just wanted to say this, sorry. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. And that's that's a principle, I, I guess, right near the beginning of this journey, I've been really inspired by and kind of thinking, you know, do, do humans form? Uh, what's the tipping point in which uh, collective behavior takes over uh, from the individual? Uh, and uh, you know, in, in response, I, I can see on the on the chats, but I know I know we're going to go to Q and A later. But uh, asking about where where do uh, the dancers fit in, and and I think mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there's there's a possibility here of of merging in can, can the the live performers merge and become part of that swarm, um, the, the the robot swarm, um, and what would that that look like? Uh, what kind of collective behaviours would, would emerge? And also, I think how the dancers can kind of influence people's experience of, of a robot. So if you are um, experiencing a robot as a sort of um, augmentation or extension of your body, um, something that is, is a kind of ongoing challenge in, you know, these sort of all aspects of that is that the robot behaves quite differently mm -hmm. to you. So it might mm -hmm. be, for example, that you create a very kind of fluid biological motion, but mm -hmm. it's much slower than your body is capable of, of moving. And so it would be interesting, I think, to see how that kind of self uh, sort of belief in self representation actually feeds back to the person using it. I think that we've had a lot of interest in this work from people who would like to use this type of extension for something like re rehabilitation or to kind of um, to augment the range of motion that somebody has. And I think through that body, this sort of emergent behavior between two humans, one of them maybe being a dancer who kind of invites the motion of the robot body, and the other one being the mm -hmm. person who is through their own motion kind of in control of the robot, that sort of emergent interaction is, it's not sort of designed as such. And I think you know, in the, the structuring of the, the workshops that Adrienne briefly uh, mentioned in, in, in the, the, the beginning of the talk where we're sort of inviting people to feed into robot design. Um, a lot of that is going to be left in the, the hands of the operator. And I think it'd be really nice to see how that, um, how the robot, the presence of the robot kind of influences emerging behavior between the two humans and, um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I guess um, I, I'm very intrigued about the, um, uh, the, a, a, the potential for a remote audience member to uh, be um, uh, viewing the performance th through the body of, of um, a, a robot agent and that perhaps if a swarm occurs, they become swept up and part of, do they feel more um they they feel part of this this new tribe this robot tribe um and then the the physical audiences and performers that they can view uh, are somehow separate from them i'm, I'm really intrigued mm -hmm. by these shifts that might occur as, as, as a result <laughs> yeah that's really interesting who like what, what kind of tribe they sit within based on how they access this this sort of uh, mm. interactive space yeah absolutely 
Yeah, so, but we, we, can, we can pick up one with the comments from this chat and it says, mm -hmm. you know, um, what's, the, what's the point of, you know, um, uh, putting robot in this uh, 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 context? Well, uh, you know, uh, who wants to see two robots make love in the next room? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, how, 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 well, how do you respond to this kind of? I, I can respond. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think uh, my choice to to work um, because obviously yeah it started off with me thinking about uh, loneliness companionship and belonging um, and I think for a lot of people when you start to talk about technology uh, there's a there's a fear in terms of something being taken away uh, and, and I think that doesn't have to be the case I, I think technologies can bring us closer um, uh, but not just to to other people, but but also um, as we've talked about a lot, um, our our environments and, and the things around us. So I guess I'm personally utilizing the the um, this idea of, of of the robots being built in order to help um, uh, audiences um, help us to to see ourselves differently, to kind of step out of our um, way of being and, and, and offer um, other possibilities that, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's a vehicle for me. It's, it's not about uh, the, the robots uh, um, representing something uh, specific. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Daria raised in the chat, which is, is sort of talking about, um, I guess, like the, the structure of this performance space and the structure of this experiment or, or interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they've said, are the robots not the performers or are they part of the environment? Can we think about the robot as an operator and also a performer? And I think that uncertainty kind of encompasses where we are with this at the moment, but that's sort of intentional, like the uh, the role that the performer, uh, sorry, the role, role the audience member has, I think can kind of um, move between performer in the sense they could be observed through the, the, the through them as an operator of a robot, um, or they could be quite um, uh, sort of um, quite removed from the, uh, the action and the interaction and, and, and just kind of viewing mm. uh, the performance. And, and in the run up to actually doing this, the, the, the development of um, these robots and how we're planning to do it is through a series of workshops where um, the design of the robot behavior is very kind of user centered so it's it's I think how we then kind of show it at the end will be very much based on how people choose to um, to operate the robots and whether they are more involved and therefore they kind of blur the line between performer audience member and an artificial um, agent or if it's kind of more um, exploratory and whether they sort of choose to, to move with a more kind of reduced range of motion and be quite static and kind of view the performance or whether they kind of choose to move more and, and use the fact that they are kind of in this maybe less restricted environment depending on how, who they are and how they're accessing it. Um, so yeah, just kind of responding to that in the chat, I think it's, it's currently um, something that hasn't taken a solid form yet. Yeah, and, and just to, uh, again, this is all speculative at the minute, but I, I love the idea that perhaps, because I, I, I know um, uh, how I, I see different audiences act differently in, in different contexts, and I, I love the idea that perhaps someone that, that's perhaps stood uh, aside from everyone else that's, that's not so keen on, on interaction, um, if they were the stood alone, it would actually attract an individual robot to go up towards them because they are alone mm -hmm. um, and, and for something to occur, a simple interaction or an offer, at least good to be there um, as, a, as a result. Um, but again, yeah, these, these are just ideas to, to actually um, the next stage once, once we're a bit further along is, is to mm -hmm. uh, take it into a space and, and see what mm -hmm. happens. Uh, one thing I know for sure is that you can daydream all you want, but it's only when you get uh, a work in front of a live audience that that um, realities and and, and um, behaviours uh, uh, very much inform where you go with something. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe um, can I show my uh, uh, the recent uh, performance uh, with the uh, no theatre player and you know uh, my Android. Uh, did some performance together. 
uh, it's just uh, the, this, there is a short version of this. Uh, so if you can play. Um, Yeah, because it's, Yeah, I, I, I don't know that whether there are many different uh, dialogues in here. So, I, I, so can, can you stop here? Probably if you have some more, you know, uh, but anyway, so what I was saying is that, you know, this, uh, this, this robot or called uh, Alter is uh, uh, making his behavior by himself. So it's a spontaneous, it's a spontaneity is the heart of this robot, right? So nobody is controlling how the robot works, but it's the robot is decide what what to do. Of course, you know because it's a scenario that uh, is the robot must follow. But uh, basically, this robot has a spontaneity inside, like a, a spike neurons and you know uh, some modules that is interacting with each other to generate behaviors. So this uh, the no theater player is start to interact with the, with this uh, robot. And try to dance with each other. That's the uh, that's this uh, performance is about. So what I'm saying is that you know uh, this robot is you know starting without without having a mind, right? But the mind is 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 it's kind of contagious from man to robot. So it's like a it's like a COVID-19, right? So um, so once you are interacting with with the human, then the mind is slowly copying to to the robot. Actually, when I did uh, my, uh, my, this robot is uh, try to imitate human behavior in front of him through his eyes that you can see the images, right? So he tried to imitate uh, human behavior. So this, that's what the robot is trying to do, right? But when I brought this one to uh, the Barbican Center, uh, the museum uh, two years ago, uh, then the robot tried to imitate human behavior, right? But it's quite often that he can't uh, imitate properly, right? So he fails to imitate human behavior. Then uh, the people come to see the, the, the robot is, you know, uh, try to imitate robot, right? It was, it was very amazing, you know, I didn't tell them to imitate a robot's behavior, but uh, people, you know, were staying there to interact for a while. Then, you know, uh, they feel like, you know, okay, the robot, they, they could, you know, get the intention of the robot, right? So they try to help robot to to interact, right? So as a result, you know the robot robot is you know imitating human behavior sometimes, right? So uh, you know the mind is coming from human to robot, but again from for, then for, from from robot to mind uh, to human being, right? So it's uh, so the mind. I don't know whether there there exists 
soul or you know mind, but it's um it's it's copying from one to the other, right? So I so in in this uh, the making up video that I said, you know, uh, the human baby can born without mind, right? But the mother or the caretakers uh, is giving mind set to 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 baby, right? Because babies usually you know have a uh, primitive um, mimicry behaviors. So when the mom, the mother uh, get angry, then uh, you know it's, the baby also gets angry, and then mother shows um, uh, sorrow face, and then the, also the baby sh shows sorrow face, right? But uh, imitating behavior is not lasting forever, right? Because it's so strange that people are just imitating you, you, you right? So at the age of one or something, that it's shifting from uh, imitation behavior to uh, autonomous behavior or spontaneous behavior, right? So this transition from uh, you know primitive imitation to independent spontaneous movement is very important, right? But nobody knows why this transition happens. But also, you know, uh, like uh, uh, a girl was brought about by the by the wolf wolf you know uh, group, so then they. Those girls, you know, this girl, I don't, I don't remember her, her name, but she behaves like a wolf, right? She runs and, you know, uh, drinks like a wolf. And because this wolf is, the, the mind is copying from, from wolf to, I think, to, to the girl, right? And then, but this is not a special case. You know, ordinarily, we are just exchanging our mind. That's my idea, right? When, once you are sitting next to you, you are, you loved one, then probably you are, your behavior is synchronized with each other. Then at the, at the same time, the mind is copying from one to the other. And the society also, right? Once you are in the member of the society, the, the, the definition of a society is exchanging minds. So if the mind is contagious, that's, that's kind of an idea. And then, you know, um, so the imitation is the first step to, to get ready for, you know, copying the mind from, from, from others. So that's the, this, um, that's the behind uh, the philosophy behind this uh, performances. I, I, it takes a long time, so I did, I just quit here. But that, that's so. It's, it's, I think it's you know in in many ways it is related to what Adrian wants to do with this uh, you know swarm with robots and how this uh, swarming robot is interacting with humans and, and how they can become the member of this swarm and this kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's really fascinating. Um, it reminds me of, uh, is it Donna Haraway that talks about um, uh, the things you make, you're inside of, of that thing, but also that thing is inside of you. It's, and it's a, it's a two-way um, exchange. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Now I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking about things in a completely different way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that kind of that transfer between human and robot and robot to human is so kind of uh, sort of like at the heart of this process and I imagine it's sort of working like a little bit like a ladder as we go through different iterations of kind of design and integration and out to our different respective sort of parts of, of, of that whether it's sort of based around performance or then developing a robot in response to performance and coming back and seeing how that interacts into it and it will be really interesting to see where that ends up I think because it's very difficult to um to predict at this point where it will go but that's sort of um the point I guess like what do what do humans find in this that um that they take respond to and then feed back does it kind of create its own little society <laughs> where there's kind of shared um principles from both the the artificial um agents that are in it and, and the human ones mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dikashi, where do you see in terms of um, alter? Where do you, where do you see um, uh, it going? Do you do you see different iterations of, of him work going forward? Or oh, you mean you, you mean uh, how do I program it? Because uh, they they can't you know uh, evolve by himself, right? I mean yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, so but you don't see um, uh, a new a completely new version. You see it as as con continuously evolving. Uh, yeah, well, well, actually, you know, uh, the, what, what is the uh, what is the interesting point here is that usually the robot doesn't do anything, you know, when there is nobody, right? The robot is just, you know, yeah, just like this, right? When there is nobody, right? But this robot is has its its uh, you know uh, his own, you know, um, so, so what I call default default mode network, right? So default mode is 
even though there's nobody, so he cannot imitate human beings because there's nobody, right? So that he retrieves memory and he plays play around with his own memory. So, but uh, when, when he, uh, when he uh, remembers uh, his memory, this memory is a little bit perturbated and then restored again. So that, you know, uh, the memory is constantly uh, perturbated and then changing eventually, right? So, uh, so even though he's, he's initially he's imitating and he's copying his beha behaviors from humankind, but because of this memory thing, right? He's retrieving memories and this retrieving processes is, is uh, changing the memory structures and then generating a new kind of memories. So it's evolutionary processes going on in the memory. So it's like a new, neural, neural Darwinism, right? So the memory is like the genes and then they are, you know, uh, mutating and then cross over with other mu uh, other memories, and then so that the new kind of behavior is emerging. And then one, you know, probably uh, there's tons of memories and tons of memory behaviors, episodic memories. So uh, that maybe, you know, uh, uh, introduces uh, individual individuality or a particular, you know, habit to 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 Android. That's where the transition happens. So from the imitation, purely imitating behavior to um, very, you know, characteristic um, individual behavior to emerge. That's 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 uh, kind of my answer to your uh, question. And well, uh, yeah, I have to uh, wait a little bit more. But um, once we do more longer term experiments, that I think we can see some of the this interesting complexity emerges. You know, once he can use the memories and generate new behaviors. Um, but yeah. we've gone on for well over an hour, so I think that's probably uh, enough for today. Thank you all so much for taking part in the discussion, um, particularly to our three speakers. Um, and we look forward to seeing what emerges with this uh, very unusual sounding dance work. Thank you very much. So, bye, everybody. Thank you very much.